Hi, I'm Stephen Jones of the Sunday Times. Lion Man, the autobiography of Ian McGeechan, is now out. It's the story of a man described by one rugby observer as one of the greatest coaches in rugby history. And there's no argument from me. It's the story of Ian McGeechan from way back, from family roots in Govan in Glasgow, right up until the scene in Johannesburg, a matter of a few weeks ago when the Lions won one of the greatest ever test matches in Johannesburg and everything between those things. Ian, um, something amazing happened on that Lions tour because when losing teams return home they're almost sort of filed away and, uh, and forgotten and unloved but there was something about the 2009 Lions which actually became a forest fire of, of warmth and affection. Yeah, it was amazing really. Steve, I think um, the fans grew into it, um, all the supporters, the press, um, obviously the players enjoyed it and there was like a spirit that the tour just developed and uh, I think also the quality of rugby that the players played in the test matches got everybody on side and although the desperation of losing the first two uh, so closely I think was, was then changed to real enjoyment and um, exhilaration with, with just the way we won the third test. You described in the book the sense of, of almost total dismay you felt the night of the second test when the Lions had, had played so brilliantly in Pretoria, was, was so well up and, and then, my goodness, didn't fate take a hand in a big way? Yeah, it did. I mean, it was. I mean, that would go down probably as my biggest rugby low, just because you're experiencing, I think, an event where you could see the players had just put so much into it, and the atmosphere of the ground, the the, the supporters, and the whole afternoon, you knew was actually quite a very special event, and to lose it in the end as we did. And to watch the players come in and almost sit in their Lions jerseys, not one of them took them off for 20 minutes afterwards, you knew that they'd just given everything to, towards um, a, a, a badge and a jersey and you could see how much had been put in and, and uh, I, you know, I found that very difficult to watch. The, uh, in terms of the ill fortune, I mean every, every sporting team who loses comes up with a hard luck story, but in terms of the Lions, I mean your team were well away, they, they, they were well ahead, some great spring box we hadn't heard a peep out of during the game, then suddenly you have this catastrophe where you, know, you lose both your centres within seconds, both your props, and then suddenly it's a different game. I mean, have you ever come across such grievous ill luck as, as those moments? No, I don't think we have. You know, the quality of the players that we lost there, um, there's no doubt that it did affect us and the fact that we went to uncontested scrums actually didn't didn't help us I don't think and yeah it, the, the disappointment was that there was like a team momentum we knew the Springboks would come back at us after the first half we'd had and for 20 minutes we were 3-0 in front and on the scoreboard in the second half and um, ultimately we just lost that rhythm and, and uh, the momentum and just the ability as we were to to be very competitive in every area and um, suddenly there was a bit of daylight that I think the Springboks got and, and saw in the game um, which hadn't been there before and ultimately uh, it allowed them back in in that last 20 minutes and uh, you know we lose a game so that it w even then was so desperately close. What, um, just going back to the first test because we're talking about a series here which was one of the, the all-time great series. It was vivid. The rugby, especially played by the Lions, w was, was magical. In the book, you, you are slightly critical of your team's slight, softer, not pos possibly soft approach in the first test match to let the Springboks get ahead. Yeah, I think um, obviously it meant a lot to the Springboks as well, and, and uh, we we were playing well. I mean, we'd made something like eight line breaks in the first half, but I thought we were being just pushed around a little bit and off the ball incidents which were just niggling which which you can't afford and I think uh, it just meant that maybe we needed a bit more of a of an edge there um, and uh, certainly you know in the second half I think the most important thing was that we we had the confidence to keep playing and and um, 
you know, settle down with some momentum and get some points on the board. But I felt probably we we needed a sort of edge to us um, to add to the rugby, and, and I think that's what we added in Pretoria. One of the things that people found amazing was that um, after the second test match, which was, was this absolutely ghastly afternoon of, of brilliant rugby but ill fortune, people thought that day there's no way that you're going to get the guys up for the third test match. What was the what were the uh, in the book you described all sorts of things like actually a few drinks was was, was, mm. was one of the things which goes back to the old days of rugby touring in a way, but what was it that got these guys back up after that awful day in Pretoria? I think the thing that had grown in the tour was that they had put so much into the Lions jersey, and I think you know Paul O'Connell led that as captain and some of the other senior players with him. They made it pretty obvious that they wanted this. Lions jersey to be a winning jersey and, and uh, they needed time after that to get over the huge disappointment of the second test and we did, uh, you know, we said we wouldn't train for three days and, you know, have a few drinks, whatever it took, some went on safari to get over the disappointment but we had to come back ready for you know, winning a, winning a test match a week later and uh, they came back on the Wednesday they were good. We were a little bit edgy to start with, but had two very good training sessions. And it, although we'd made eight changes, um, I think the fact that we'd all trained together and we'd all developed tactically through the whole tour helped us because there was a continuity that that stayed in training and and stayed in the game, which ultimately I think was very important. And you know there was a desire there, a desperate desire to uh, to win in that jersey. After we uh, the Lions came back. Um uh, other teams, New Zealand and Australia, went to South Africa, were absolutely hammered. In the context of all that, do you feel that the, your third test performance uh, in in Johannesburg, of all places where South Africa hardly ever lose, was one of the one of your best in all your lines to us? Yes, and I have to, just because of the circumstances of of it being in Johannesburg, which is a very difficult place to to win anyway the third game, a final test of the Lions Tour, which is always difficult to win. Um, and just with everything else that had gone on, I think the quality of rugby that w we were able to produce and the players had that focus and, and that real commitment to do it um, was probably yeah, as satisfying as any game or a any, any team performance that I've been involved with. You spoke about um, the number of line breaks and brilliant attacking in the first test match and indeed in the second. Um, I, I've never seen attacking play from, from a British or an Irish team like it. Do you think that really should have, have showed that you can attack like that in the modern game and hopefully w would have sort of set a beacon that other teams in Britain and Ireland will, will pick up? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think at least it gives an example of, you know, you can look at it and take from it things which can be developed and uh, you know I genuinely feel tactically at the end of that tour we were we were on the bottom you know subsequently looking at some of the Tri-Nations games I think it just showed you know how much we'd got right as a as a team and, and as a group uh, tactically um, I think we, it also helped going back to the global laws and not playing under the ELVs because it brought that ability to have variety tactically to what we did now, in a way, it cost us probably a test series in the, the spring box in the early um, parts of the game. The tests were, were better than us at the driving moral again, but I still believe that that gives you something, that nothing uh, as a variety um, to, to work with. And I think it, it just, I think hopefully we've shown if you have the attitude and the approach to keep the ball in play or to take the advantage of, you know, ball I see kick ball kicked sometimes as turnover ball um, to be encouraged to, to attack and use it. It needs a commitment, it needs a fitness and it needs a physicality but I think it can be a game that is exciting under these now global laws. One, one more thing about the Lions Tour. Um, the Lions Tour have got a great sense of history about them but they, it, people have tried to modernise the Lions in, 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 in recent years. In many ways what comes up in, in the book is it was very much a back to basics Lions tour. Do you feel that was one of the successes and one of the reasons why the chemistry stayed so good? 
Yes, I'd like to think so. I mean, it was one thing I'd, you know, gone in with from the year previous when um, I'd spoken to the Lions Board before I was appointed that I believe there's certain principles that are important to creating a good Lions environment for the players, for the management, for everybody. Um, and that, you know, those were the things I would stick with and, and if they didn't want that approach, then, you know, please don't appoint me. But uh, I believe that when you've got a group of people coming together, um, there are certain ways of, of that chemistry evolving and developing, and um, and I think some of it it's not obvious. It's just it's just good, tried and tested ways of people. If you get to know somebody and you get to like somebody, then when you're on the field under pressure, you tend to look after each other. And I think that's ultimately what what happened on this tour. That, the players got a chance to really know and understand each other and enjoy each other's company on and off the field. We um, we, we read about s to seven lines tours, not just all nine. Um, the two you made as a player and, and five you made as a, either, either head coach or, or coach. I mean, looking back on it, isn't it incredible how much they've changed since you set off in 74 with no doctor, no physio, you know, no, for goodness sake, no assistant coach or anything. I mean, isn't it amazing? in a reasonably short period of time how much they changed because it was really high tech this time. Yeah, it's incredible, you know, you're looking at a su uh, support staff of, of nearly 30 people, you, you're looking at uh, analysis systems which, you know, were backed up over the internet from the UK to South Africa and, and looking at a coordinated information set that was was going to the players um, in, the, in what we hoped was the the most efficient way possible but um, going back to 1974 with 30 players one manager one coach if you got injured you had to queue in the physios waiting room wherever you were and, and take your public. turn with the general public yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you used to go back and train or uh, wait and see in a doctor's surgery if you wanted any headache tablets or whatever and um, although I suppose one of the advantages we had was we had two doctors in um, in '74 in, in Ken Kennedy and JPR, and um, so they tended to give us salt tablets or other things. But it was pretty basic and and, and very straightforward about uh, what we did and how we did it. In um, just to pick out one more line, through the seven. I mean, it's all in there. But um, uh, '89 was your first as a coach. '93 uh, you came so close to winning in New Zealand, but '97 would appear to be the first sort of modern day Lions tour and, and, and in, in many ways the one that ensured that it would, there would always be Lions tours? Yes, I, th I think there was talk in 93 of how long the Lions could last and, and 97 I think as the game had gone professional was the first professional Lions tour obviously still carried a lot of the amateur ethos with it uh, but I felt was the bridge between the amateur game and the professional game uh, we'd got a professional management of 12. Uh, we looked at it very professionally in what we did for um, player analysis and opposition analysis. And the whole thing, I think, fits together so well. I still think some of the rugby, not so much in the test matches, but out, was very close to the rugby that I'd always aspired to as a coach. And I think the players enjoyed it. And those, those principles that were there, you know, still applied this time that um, you know you'd be very professional in your approach but but very human in the way that you come together and and, and make the most of it and, you know 97 you know for me was 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 everything that Alliance tour should be and um, that's why I was so keen that 2009 had its own identity but but worked on the, those principles as well another one of the threads is uh, obviously um, your wife found out to a horror uh, when you when you've been <laughs> seeing the parades that you were Scottish, and she never, she'd never realised that before. But the Scottishness uh, was very much um, uh, a lead and and, and attributed to your, to your dad, who was you know who was a obviously a proud Scot. Uh, you were born in Leeds, but the Scottishness seemed to come back seep back into you through your dad, and and sort of took you north of the border to play rugby, and then to coach. Yes. Um it was. I mean, he was he was a proud proud Scot, and uh, he'd been a Scottish soldier as well, which I think, uh, you know, he was very proud of. Uh, most of the family r relations were still in Scotland, so there was there was a strong link, even though 
had a relatively strong Yorkshire accent and still um, the ambitions to play cricket for Yorkshire. Um, but it, it, it was strong and, and um, you know, I had that strong feeling through him as much as, as anything and, and um, you know, did um, turn down an England trial to uh, uh, to take a Scottish trial, although it then took me four years of Scottish trials before mm. I got picked. But uh, it was very important to me in the end to, to be able to wear a Scottish jersey. And, and um, you know, in your time as a player, uh, Geach, and as a coach, Scotland were incredibly competitive. They stood at the, uh, they, you know, they dined at the high table with everybody. They were bloody minded, is the expression we, we've used, and always difficult to beat. Is there a sadness now that actually, until recently, or indeed including recently, that sort of canniness and that passion and that bloody mindedness has, has, has seemed to have seeped away somehow? Yeah, I, I think um, the difficulty is when you, the game goes professional and the structures go professional it becomes very much a numbers game of where the talent is and you do have to have a coordinated approach to to use every ounce of talent and talented player that is available and you know some of the talented sportsmen have to choose rugby and and I think um, you know I mean I think I was lucky in the 70s I, th I think British rugby was at the top of the tree and I think Scottish rugby had a lot of characters a lot of characters around the game and uh, still Playing wise, the biggest disappointment was not winning a triple crown or Grand Slam in 1975 when you know I felt in that championship we probably were the best team. Um, and I think since the game's gone professional, um, it, it, it's that ability to understand that the top players have to get through to professional teams, and ideally, everybody else has got three teams or more to develop players. You know, Scotland are working with two. Uh, finances are, you know, more of a problem, and and I think the danger is that the base has got narrow, um, w which means that it's much more difficult to have players coming through who have that same competitive edge or competitive background. One of the things um, talking about rugby itself, the book is extremely positive about the state of the game. We've gone through the way the games develop on the field, but. Um, but by using examples of, uh, for instance, the incredible uh, devotion, dedication and courage of, of Yorkshire rugby people in the First World War and the pride which, uh, you know, or, or rather the good image that they gave to, to rugby, you think that that's actually carried on and that rugby for, for young people uh, is still a great pastime and, and, and it's still as great as it ever was? Yes, I mean, I, for me, it's the ultimate team sport um, and team game because you physically feel support of somebody alongside you and when you get it right you know often what you achieve is bigger than the sum of the individual parts or individual talent and you need players of varying size varying abilities some who just become the cement to make sure the walls built properly and the team can perform and, and I think rugby is very unique in, in, in what it gives and, and what it brings and uh, you know it's it made a huge impact on, on me and the people I met and the games I played and, and, uh, and there's no doubt that without that I mean um, you know th there's no way my life would have been anywhere near as, as, as happy or as enjoyable it's, as it's been. And also you were lucky, do you feel you were fortunate because you played for Heading Lee and for Scotland in the era of, of, of real strict amateurism, I mean, you had to buy your own socks <laughs> when you played for Scotland, etc. Do you actually feel that's given you a, a, a kind of brilliant insight? Because now you're at the very top of the high-tech pro game, but you did play in the, in the amateur years. Yeah, I, th I think it does, because I don't think you take anything for granted. Um, you know, there's, I think I was lucky that I got good advice at, at key times, which, which made me make good decisions. And I still think now that young players coming through, even professional, need good advice and good support and good coaching if they're going to make the most of their talent. And I think through good people, um, you know, just putting themselves out for me, I feel that, you know, I was lucky that I could take steps forward that probably I have never envisaged taking. And, and you take one step and then something else becomes possible. And I think that is still the case now that um, you know the best teams will not change this this last Lions team was there 
and almost successful because there were no egos that, that everybody was putting in to the team everything that they had and I think professionally if we can keep that balance and you know we 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 have the team as the most important thing then a will get good rugby but B will still continue to produce very good people in the um uh, the, 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 the book Lion Man it's very positive at the end about the future of the Lions and obviously uh, people have already been saying look there's no way the Lions can go uh, and not have your store of knowledge of, of all the ups and downs and the glories of, of your seven tours so can we assume <laughs> that your Lions uh, tale is not yet told <laughs> um it, would, know, it would be ridiculous if your store of knowledge wasn't used. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, and we've had some discussions, that I, I will be involved in some of the decision making for the planning of the next tour, and I would like to do that. You know, I, I would like to be involved in the planning and to try and make sure that, um, you know, the next head coach, whoever leads, has the right things in place, rather than, you know, it, it being done ad hoc or certainly the rugby part almost being dominated by the home country because I think the Lions do need the support not only of you know the four home countries but whichever country they're playing as well and, and uh, it's in everybody's interest to keep the Lions where they are because in, in player terms and in supporter terms it is the biggest team in the world. Finally um, when you gave up playing for Headingley you immediately became the Headingley coach and therefore um, condemned yourself to decades after decades <laughs> of coaching. Judy, your wife, early on in your coaching career, said, asked you, how long will you be doing this coaching lab for? And your answer was, well, until I've run out of ideas. The lines to it would appear to suggest that you've not re run out of ideas. No, I like I like that challenge because I think the game changes, and I think it, 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 the the fact that you look at the game evolving and wanting to do something that's the next step on. I enjoy that challenge tactically. I always have done look at what's there and, and where we might go and what we might change or what might be effective and then working with players to get the best team performance together and maybe that's the teacher in me but I, I certainly enjoy that environment. We've called it the boot room environment with the coach. It's just talking through every idea. Some you throw out but when they fit together it does give you the next step and something else to get excited about that you maybe haven't done before.